Sing at Calvary. That's our first hymn, and it is in uh, on 338 in your hymnal or on the wall. So stand with me and sing at Calvary. Good ear. I spin in vanity and pride, carry not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found My sin I'd learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, burned and there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found everything now I gladly to him as my king now my rapture soul can only sing of Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burden soul fell liberty salvation's plan oh the grace that brought it down to man oh the mighty goal that God did span that Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burden so fell liberty and cast bow with me in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we uh, come together today to uh, celebrate Calvary and what happened on that cross that your son died for us and as an atonement for our sins, Lord, and to give us eternal life. We just thank you for that. We thank you for the love that you give us, the grace that you give us that we don't deserve. We thank you for everyone that's here today. We ask that you bless each and every one of us as we go through this time of worship and praise and, and fellowship, Lord. Give us uh, your wisdom. Give us the courage to share as we go through this week. Be with Abby as she brings us a message today. We pray this in the name of him who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll sing two more. We're going to sing 196 and 176 in your hymn all there. So remain seated. We'll sing those right together. Yeah. 
had found in his day. And there may I no while as he wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away. Seventy-six in him and all. Kingdom, my life, I grant thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget. I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of mind arrayed, guarded thee whilst thou slept, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget my agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me like Mary through the gloom come with a gift to thee show to me now the empty tomb lead me to Calvary lest I forget Gethsemane lest I forget thine agony lest I forget thy love for me Lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even thy cup of grief to share, thou hast borne all for me. Lest 
Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. That's right. As we move to a time of prayer, a um, couple of things. It's good to see Chris here today. She's been on our list for a while. Uh, she's hobbling around with that cane and, and what's that, kinetic tape uh, that she's got all over holding herself together, I guess. It's probably better than gorilla tape or dunk, duct tape or something like that, but it's good to see her today. Good to see Sarah with us after having her knee worked on and, and uh, able to come back and, and share with us today. Um, there is there is one empty seat. Um, I guess luck would have it there's no birthdays this week. Nobody to call. There's nobody to make the call now. So we are uh, glad to have Dawn's family with us today. Sorry for your loss. Let's go to prayer. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you today. Um, you are our power. You are our strength. Uh, you show us your love. You show us your grace. We can come to you um, to be thankful for all that you do for us, for all that you provide for us daily through our lives, Lord. We uh, thank you that uh, you sent your Son to die on the cross for us, that uh, we can have everlasting life with you. Uh, we just uh, praise you for that. We uh, lift up a number of things today, Lord. We lift up our country who's just going through some trying times, and uh, we just ask for your, your interference and in all that's going on and help us to have revival and, and bring our country back to praising you and loving you on a daily basis, Lord, throughout the country. Uh, we just uh, look around the world at all the things that are going on through the wars and, and desolate things that are happening and um, Lord we just pray for your hand in all of those that um, that we know how uh, you want them to come out we know how that you know how they are going to come out Lord we just ask for you to be there among them uh, just on a local basis Lord we just have a list of things of people that need your touch uh, whether it's uh, uh, just your love your care uh, doctor's wisdom, nurse's care, um, everything that's going on, we just pray for Don Mock's family. Um, show them your love, your concern, your care. We know that he's there with you now, and uh, we're just going to miss those phone calls. We ask that you be with uh, Karen Ferry on the, uh, and her family on the passing of her brother, uh, be a comfort there. Be with Helen Hornberger, Lee Ray's sister, as she recuperates. Um, be with her after that nasty fall and, and uh, just be a healing hand there. Be with Edward King. Um, he's had another bad stroke, and, and uh, we just need your, your healing hand, your comfort, your care. Be with family and doctors as they uh, deal with that. Um, Jim Clark at home dealing from the blood clot. Blood clot. Uh, we know that recovery is there. We just ask for you to be with him. Uh, Jill at home this week uh, after knee surgery. Uh, help her to recover well, uh, to get back on her feet and going strong. Sue Christensen recovering in Mound Ridge. Give her the peace that she is where she needs to be uh, to be able to take care of herself and, and to get back home. We thank you for the success of Sarah's surgery, that uh, she's up and going, and, and uh, just thank you for that. Chris being back with us today after all that she had going on with the fall and, and things going on, please be with her. She continues physical therapy and strengthen her. SCB with Lisa, Lisa Andrews' housemate's friend, um, had a heart attack and is having some other complications in the hospital. Lord, uh, the doctors, the nurses need your wisdom and your care on how to take care of her. We ask that you be with Charlie and Susan as they go day to day in, in uh, confusion and things going on in the house. and uh, Just uh, uh, be there among them and, and show them your care. 
be with uh, Janice, Chris's Sandow's friend, and uh, with the new tumor that's found and, and uh, the others no longer shrinking, Lord, we ask for your inner, your, your being among that to, to help things work out right. Be with Lisa Unruh as she continues to work in the Omega House Project. Um, help her to be that witness for you among the people that live there and, and uh, that she can just uh, be the guidance that they need. Uh, be with Vern Henry and all that's going on and his health issues. Um, as they do more tests and, and see what's going on, uh, just help him to uh, get through all of that. Give Gloria McMurray your strength as she continues on day to day. Um, I think that humor is still there, Lord. She just needs your strength to be able to get up and around and, and to do the things she needs to do. Thank you for the recovery from the surgery for Jerry Mackey and, and the cancer issues that she's dealing with. Continue to be with her. Um, we ask you to be with Shana, friend of uh, Diana Larson, who's facing challenges in her battle of cancer. Um, give her your wisdom. Let her see what, uh, what can be done and, and what should be done, along with the doctors and the nurses, Lord. Um, I know we all have some um, private concerns that we would like to share with you, Lord, and at this time we just would share those. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> yeah, I want to also, uh, I want to tell you that, uh, you know, Donnie, uh, he's always right there, sitting there, it, years, you know. What a, what a sense of humor that guy had. He and I go round and round, and he, <laughs> and he, I'd, I'd, I'd kid him, I'd say, Donnie, we're, neither one of us are on the list this week. He said, "Well, I thought it was a good week." <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna miss him. So he'll, we'll see him again. He touched me uh, 504 in your hymn. That's what we'll sing uh, next. And so, main seated 504. He touched me. Gentle by a heavy burden. Load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me, oh, he touched me. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me whole Since I met His blessed Savior Since He cleansed and made me me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul, something happened, and now I know, he touched me, and Um, as a time for uh, giving today, um, I was looking. Uh, Paul is talking to the people at Corinthians at Corinth, and um, he's encouraging them to give. And uh, the church was pretty strong, um, and the gifts that he was they were giving was to help support him and his work and and in the growth of the church. And in Second Corinthians um, eight seven, it says. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, 
in complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Ushers. Next time I'll come prepared. <laughs> well, it's so good to be with all of you. I always enjoy our time worshiping with you and being able to uh, just catch up and see how everything's going. Today is the third Sunday in Lent, and for most of our tradition, we probably have learned to give something up. How many of you have given something up so far this Lent? Oh, no. <laughs> Well, we're three weeks in, so I don't blame you. That's a long time to commit to no chocolate or whatever else you might have given up. But many of us grew up learning to give something up for Lent. But don't worry, because today I was going to say we don't have to give something up, but we can start something. So I'm going to talk about that, but first I want uh, to also talk about one of my favorite Bible stories, but before I get there, I'm going to talk to you about a little something that I struggle with. And I grew up this way. I grew up with a mom, and some of you have met my mom. She's been here before. She's not here today, so I can talk about her. My mom is always prepared my whole life for something to go wrong, for the world to end. We had a pantry full for Y2K. We were prepared. Are any of you this way? preparing for the worst. Thankfully, in March of 2020, I was living in Arizona, and my mom called, and she said, I just sent you a package of toilet paper, which was good because I was running out. She didn't have to go to the store because she was prepared for a toilet paper shortage, like she knew it was coming. And so I follow in her footsteps. I tend to worry, I tend to stress, I tend to fear what might be coming or what could go wrong or what's going to happen. Last night, because I haven't preached in a while, I laid in bed and I thought, what time was church again? And I looked it up about 10 times just to make sure. 
When I first started preaching off of an iPad, I would print the sermon as well because I was worried. What happens if the iPad dies and I have to wing it? Well, we'll all find out, I guess. But I grew up learning to prepare for what could go wrong. And so I lay in bed at night and I worry about my friends and my family and my finances and everything that could possibly happen. And so I have learned as I've pastored people that there are those of us who worry, who are driven by fear. There are those of us who have shame, who are worried that we're not doing enough, that we're not doing it right, that we're missing something, that we're not producing enough, that we're not successful enough. And there are those of us who anger really is strong, that we need to be in control and have it figured out that we're, we have to be perfect enough and right enough. And so I found in studying the human brain as well that those are the three core things that drive us. It's shame and anger and fear. Those are the voices that tend to whisper the loudest in our minds. They tell us these false stories about who we are and what we need to do and how we should behave. And so... When those are the stories that are so powerful, they reach down into our most animalistic brains. This is what then our advertisers and our country and different uh, voices in the world have learned that they can manipulate us and persuade us and convince us if they're able to speak to that voice of fear and anger and shame. And if we're not paying attention, if we're just living our lives out of this autopilot existence, which we do almost 90% of the time, we just go through the motions day after day, year after year, we don't wake up to the story that God has for us. And so today, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite Bible stories, and it's of someone who was living on autopilot. I assume, for most of their life. They were just going through the motions, and then one day something changes. And so turn with me to John chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13 this morning. This is the story of Nicodemus, who you might have heard about. Nicodemus belonged to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish ruling council, And sometimes the New Testament refers to them as the chief priests and the elders of the people. It was made up of 71 elders who were judges and scribes, and it was led by the high priest, who functioned kind of like a president. They were the ruling council, and they were responsible for all the things. They were responsible for the spiritual, the political, and the legal affairs of the Jewish people. And they were the ones who charged Jesus of claiming to be the Messiah. They're the ones who accused Peter and John of heresy. They're the ones who uh, met with Stephen on a charge of blasphemy. And they're the ones who met with Paul for violating the temple law. This is the ruling people of the Jews. It's the highest honor to serve on this council. And not just anybody can be on this council. But this is what you would have wanted your children to be. Instead of being a doctor or a lawyer or a farmer, you would have wanted your children to be on the Sanhedrin council. Nicodemus had to be born into the right Jewish family. So you have to have the right lineage, the right pedigree. He had to have come from somebody um, who had enough prestige that could get him onto the council. He had to live a righteous life. He had to follow all the rules and do everything he was supposed to do. There were strict codes that they had to follow, and Nicodemus would have had a lot of power and influence and respect in his community. He had probably a relatively comfortable life. He probably um, was well off and had certainty about his future. Nicodemus was living the best life. His life was following a great trajectory. He had this sense of upward mobility and status until one night. 
We don't have the backstory here. We don't know exactly what led to this moment that Nicodemus, we imagine maybe he was lying awake that night, just couldn't fall asleep, or maybe he'd been contemplating this for a while. Maybe he had been thinking about it. But one night he decided under the cover of darkness to find Jesus. Something shook him. Have you ever had this, this moment where Everything all of a sudden you feel like it's changing or there's something you just can't let no, let go. You have to be, um, you have to figure this out. Something jolted him awake or something kept him awake and he couldn't let it go. And so night is usually contrasted in scripture with day. And so night, there's, there's something here. He has to go under the cover of darkness because no one can know he's doing this. He couldn't go in the day where everyone could know what he was up to. So he goes under the cover of night and he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Rabbi, he acknowledges Jesus from the start as rabbi. He gives him a prestigious title, acknowledging his role and authority. And then there's no question that follows. You would imagine he's there in the middle of the night and he has a pressing question, but it's almost like Nicodemus can't even put the question together. It's as if this has been burning in him and he doesn't even know what he's there to ask now. And so Jesus says, very truly I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And then he asks, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. It's as if he's working really hard to miss the point here. And so Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. You must be born again. You, Nicodemus, Jesus says, you who are a very intelligent man who was born from the perfect prestigious family, who have this really great job, who follow all the rules and all the codes and do everything right, you need to be born again. And so Nicodemus, a man of birthright, a man who had everything, who had every privilege, if he had to be born again, that meant that he was going to lose everything he had. When I read this, I was struck when I realized that Jesus is telling this very religious man, this very righteous man, that he had to be born again. And never again does Jesus say this in scripture. He does not tell the thief on the cross or the Samaritan woman at the well. He doesn't tell anyone that he heals It is to the religious leader, the Pharisee, the man on the Sanhedrin council who followed all of the rules, who knew the scriptures in and out. His physical birth was one to have been envied. His knowledge and accomplishments were to be praised. And he is the one who needs to be born again. I've spent most of my life reading and studying and understanding this is a message for new believers, for people new to the faith that need to be born again. But then when I read this text, I realized that this is actually a message for those of us who have been going to church, who have been reading the Bible, who have been attending Sunday school, who have been doing our best to give up things for Lent, maybe not us here, but other people who have given up things for Lent, we have tried to follow the scriptures, to know them, and to understand them. This is a message to Nicodemus. This is a message to us as followers of Jesus, who have maybe been following for most of our lives, we are the ones that this message is for, that we must be born again. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. 
The wind blows where it, where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Three times Jesus uses this Greek word pneuma, which means wind or breath or spirit. Nicodemus would have heard this message from Jesus, and it would have taken him to Genesis. It would have taken him to the creation story where God's spirit is breathed into our lungs. Every breath that we breathe in is a gift from God. This word is three times wind, breath, spirit. We really don't know what happens to Nicodemus after he hears this. The story ends with us not knowing what he chooses to do next. We meet him two other times in the gospel. We meet him at Jesus' trial, where he fights to be sure that Jesus gets a fair trial. And then we see him again at the burial with spices in hand. But this story of Nicodemus wasn't told so that we would know what happens to Nicodemus. It was told so that we could understand the depth, the transformation required of us to be able to experience the kingdom of God. It's a story for us, church-going, religious, Jesus followers, that we would have to remember that every breath we breathe is a gift of God. Nicodemus had lived the right life and knew the right people and said the right words and believed the right ideas and operated in the right system. And still he sought out Jesus to answer a question that he never needed to ask. We don't know where this goes. But my question for us today is what will we do with this message? Because we can go about our lives living on autopilot We can give up the simple things for a couple of weeks. We can give up chocolate or or whatever it might be. But what we are called to do is change our hearts, to wake up to God's presence in our lives and in our world. When we're driven by fear and shame and anger, that's us just living on our autopilot existence. And when I think about the breath of God, I can't help but think about the way that God has wired our bodies. We have an autonomic nervous system, and there's two parts to it. There's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And the sympathetic is what happens to us when we're, when we're living out of fear and shame. It's our, our fight or flight or freeze response. It's what our hearts do when we haven't really conditioned them. And then there's the sympathetic, the parasympathetic nervous system, which regulates our body and brings us back to a sense of calm and peace. And when I studied this, I found that that system turns on when we breathe. God designed our bodies so that when we pay attention to his breath in our lungs, our body comes back to a state of calm and peace. Every breath that we take is a breath of God in our lungs. And I actually have a watch that I have it set up so every hour it reminds me to breathe so that I can come back and remember that I am in God's presence every moment of every day. Breathing brings us back to calm and it's proven to decrease stress and relieve pain and detoxify the body and improve immunity and energy and blood pressure and digestion. And it shuts down our sympathetic nervous system. It shuts down that fear, that anxiety, that stress, that anger, that shame. And the more we breathe, the quieter that voice gets and the louder the voice of God in our lives. The first thing that every baby must do when it is born is take a breath. Our bodies, our flesh, do not survive on one breath, but it's one breath after another after another, each given to us by God. Because breathing reminds our body that only God sustains life. With every inhale and exhale, in and out, we remember that we must depend solely on the Spirit for life. 
When we start to breathe in this kind of breath, we start to see the kingdom of God taking shape all around us. We begin to notice that God is in every moment, and we can see it more clearly. In Lent, we want to give up habits and vices that aren't serving us, but it's good to replace those things to begin to put in a practice. And so today I wanted to teach you one of my favorite spiritual practices, and it's really simple and it's really powerful. This is something you can do every day as often as you remember. It's called the breath prayer. And so you breathe in the breath of God and you exhale something in response to that. And so here's a few examples. The most common breath prayer is to breathe in Lord Jesus Christ and breathe out have mercy on me a sinner. Or breathe in light of Christ awaken me from sleep or breathe in spirit breath of God and exhale fill me with your life all of these are reminders that the inhale is God in our lungs and we exhale more of us so that we can take in more of God and become more like Christ in the process and so I want to take a minute we're going to practice this together and then you can remember this on the top of every hour or maybe every couple of hours during the day. It's just a couple of simple breaths. And so we're going to do it right now together. We inhale, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. So in and out, in and out, just a few times. This reminds us all day long to center ourselves around God in every breath that we take. This practice opens us to a constant union with Christ throughout the day, reminding us that the Spirit is breathed into our lungs. We breathe life in and we exhale. And so I want to challenge you this week to practice this as many times as you remember or just a few times a day to center yourself on the breath of God. Because this message of Nicodemus is a message for us to wake up to God's presence all around us and breathe in the life of Christ. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this reminder today that you call us to be born again, that we are to breathe in the Spirit, that we are to breathe in your life, that every breath is a gift. God, go with us through this week as we continue in the practices of Lent and we prepare ourselves for the journey to the cross. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.
Thank you, Abby. Appreciate you. Thanks for coming and uh, being with us today, helping out, helping Dan out, and all of us. We'll uh, we'll sing one more. Uh, that said, one more hit. We'll sing one more hit. But it's hymn <laughs> four twenty two in your hymnal. We'll stand and sing. No, not one.
friend like him is a high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend of sneak and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Did ever saint find his friend forsake him? No, not one. No, not one. Or sinner find that he would not take him. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one. No, us a home in heaven. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Christ.